Have you ever had this happen before? You're studying the Bible and you come upon a verse that just doesn't make sense. Maybe it doesn't sound like the kind of thing Jesus would say, or maybe it's written in a way that's just confusing. No matter how many times you read it though, you just can't make sense of it. I mean, I'll be honest, I've had this happen to me hundreds of times over the years. But recently, I discovered a Bible study hack that blew me away. When I started implementing this hack, all of a sudden passages that never made sense before started to become totally clear. And better yet, it transformed my Bible studies even for passages I thought I understood. Want to know what it is? Well, then join me for this episode of Beyond the Words. Now, before we start, if you want even more Bible study hacks just like the one that we're teaching in this video, then make sure to click the link above and down in the description where you can download a free resource I created called Five Bible Study Strategies. It's filled with simple, concise strategies that you can apply quickly and begin to see immediate results. And like I said, it's totally free. Okay, let's dive into today's lesson. Okay, so this hack that I discovered is something I like to call shifting perspectives. And essentially, it's five simple steps that when you do them, allow you to see a passage in a whole new way and passages that made no sense suddenly become as clear as day. But here's something I need you to know. The first four steps in this process may seem pretty simple. I mean, you might even feel like you've done them already. But when you combine them with the fifth step, that changes everything. Things just suddenly click. It's like when you add salt to a cookie and suddenly it tastes like no cookie you've ever eaten before. You can't just eat salt and expect to have that same experience. You've got to complete the rest of the recipe before the salt can make any difference. And the same is true here. You've got to go through the first four steps. And once you have, and then you complete step five, well, that is when really amazing things start to happen. So let's jump right into step one. In order to shift your perspective, the first thing you have to do is read a passage and solely focus on the big picture. And what that means is before you get into the details of what the passage means or what exactly is happening, you first need to figure out what's the bigger picture here. For instance, if you're reading a specific teaching about Jesus, you want to ask things like, how did Jesus get here? What happened before this? What has he been teaching so far? Who else is with him? Have we seen those people before? Because here's what you always need to remember. The Bible always assumes you know the big picture. Books that come later in the Old Testament assume you know the stories that occurred earlier in the Old Testament. The Gospels were often read in one sitting, so Mark assumes that by chapter 12, you remember what happened in chapter 2. So you always have to begin by getting a sense of the big picture. And then, once you've gotten a sense of the big picture, start writing things down. Write down what you notice, highlight things that stand out, jot down any questions that you have, get everything in your head down onto paper. And I know this might seem basic, but so few people do it. I mean, I rarely did it for most of my life, but it's a critical step that will dramatically impact future steps. Now, here's one warning though. Don't spend any time here trying to answer the questions you come up with. Don't spend any time interpreting what all of it means. You're going to do those things later, but you don't want to do them yet. Because the next step you want to complete is to read through the passage again, this time focusing strictly on the details. So with the big picture in mind, now start looking at key details in the names of people, locations, key words that seem important to the passage. I mean, really dig deep here. What is the smallest thing that might matter? What are the things that you usually read over that you've never noticed before? And then, just like you did on your first read through, take note of all the questions you have, the thoughts you have, the words you notice, the things you want to research further. Again, you're not interpreting or trying to answer any of this just yet. You're just jotting it all down before you go on to the fifth step. And, and actually, before we do, let me give you an example of what this might look like. For instance, in chapter 3 of Mark's Gospel, Mark tells us of an encounter between Jesus and scribes from Jerusalem. He says, And he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they were not even able to eat a meal. And when his family heard this, they went out to restrain him, for they were saying, He has lost his mind. And the scribes who had come down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul. 
and by the ruler of the demons, he expels the demons. And he called them to himself, and he was speaking to them in parables. How can Satan expel Satan? And so as you can see, this is one of those passages that can be truly confusing. I mean, why would Jesus' family say he's out of his mind? And what is all this talk about Beelzebul? And why would they think that Jesus is possessed by Satan? I mean, this is one of those places where you definitely want to step back and shift perspectives. And so as you did this, as you dove into step one and you began looking at this from a big picture perspective, you'd notice things like how there's tension between Jesus and religious leaders, both in this passage and in passages leading up to it. And so you'd want to make a note of that and go back and see where and why and how this has happened so far in Mark's gospel. You might notice how Jesus is teaching a large crowd and you'd want to look at where else he's drawn crowds in Mark's gospel. What happened in those moments? Or you might notice that Jesus' family is present and you'd ask yourself, have we seen them before? What is his relationship with his family like? And then finally, you'd want to ask questions like, are these things, right, religious leaders and crowds and Jesus' family, are they connected in any way? And all of a sudden, this would begin to help you to get a sense of the big picture of what's happening here. And as you're noticing and wondering all of this, you're writing it down, step two, and then you move on to step three. Once you've tackled this big picture, you'd then hone in on the details. You'd pay attention to how Mark says that Jesus went home. And you'd ask, where is that? Why is that significant? How does that impact the tone of this passage? Or you might notice that Jesus' family says that he's lost his mind. Well, what Greek words are being used there? What else could those words mean? And then a few verses later, right, when we see the scribes claim that Jesus is possessed by Beelzebul, you might write down, who is that? Does he appear somewhere else in the Bible? How does that impact the charge that they're making here? And again, you're not answering these things, you're just writing them down. You're jotting down your thoughts and your perceptions and just allowing yourself to be filled with all of this information, to soak it all in and allow these pieces to come together. And then this is where you finally dive into the fifth and the final step, the one step that so many people miss and that brings all of this together, right? This is the one hack I wish I'd learned years ago. And that is to compare your lists from steps two and four. I know it might sound simple, right? But it's like adding the salt to the chocolate chip cookie. It requires all the other steps in the recipe in order for this to work. And it does. Because when you compare these two lists, this is the sort of thing that really stretches you as you study the Bible. Most of the time, we're either zeroing in on the details of a passage or we're reading a whole bunch of scripture and capturing the big picture. But this is where you're bringing those two together, right? You've applied these two lenses separately. And now, you're bringing it all into one place and you're allowing those things to blend into some incredible insight. For instance, in that Mark passage that we just looked at, as you've been reflecting back on the bigger picture, right? The things that have happened so far in Mark's gospel and the questions that you came up with about Jesus's past interactions with religious leaders, you may have begun to wonder a big picture question like, why might they have come all the way from Jerusalem to accuse him? What drew them to this place where Jesus is preaching, these scribes specifically? At the same time, you might have also honed in on some details and asked questions like, well, why did they refer to him using the specific term Beelzebul, right? This ruler of demons. And looking at these two things together, now you're asking, how does the big picture connect with these smaller details? And if you explored this further, what you'd find is that the first time Jesus got in trouble with the scribes, men like these religious leaders who are accusing him, was when he cast out demons, right? In Mark 1, Jesus casts evil spirits out of a man in a synagogue in Capernaum. But it wasn't the fact that Jesus cast out these demons uh, that made the scribes angry. It's the fact that this miracle came in conjunction with a moment when the people of Capernaum were amazed at Jesus' teachings and decided that Jesus was teaching like one who had authority and not like the scribes. I mean, do you see how that changes things? Do you see how that adds a whole new layer to the passage in Mark 3? How it leads you to a place where you can make these connections between the scribes and demons, how the macro and the micro, the big picture and the details are all coming together here. And that's why this fifth step is so important. It forces you to combine these two unique perspectives to shift how you're reading a passage. And when you do, 
Connections start forming, questions start popping up, and you begin to go down a path that will lead you to answers and insights that you have never found before. What was once strange and confusing now makes total sense. And so if you enjoyed this strategy, and if you want to learn other strategies that will shift the way that you read the Bible, then make sure to click the link above and down in the description to download my free resource, Five Bible Study Strategies. And if you'd like to see more Bible study hack videos like this one, then just click this link over here. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.